Hi, and welcome to our weekly River Guide Professionalism series. This is something we're doing every Monday at 1230 Pacific Time, just to touch on different topics about river guiding, about how to professional river guiding. And we've had a few good episodes recently about leadership and safety talks. And this week, I want to once again introduce my friend and coworker, Destin Abbott. Destin is a very prolific guide and outdoorsman. He uh, He's an instructor for Knowles. He's a international rafting federation and aca instructor he's a longtime river guide and just all around awesome dude and he wants to talk about river guides guide to professionalism and i think i think this is a huge topic to cover because i think that we don't always know what professionalism is it's not something we talk about and so i i'm really excited to have dustin talk about it so so we can put a label on it so with that welcome dustin sweet thanks zach um this idea of professionalism is kind of something that i've been thinking about for a while now um but it's been i've had a problem like trying to define it um so for those of you who are watching if you want to like try and throw down what you think um uh professionalism means to you real quick in the comments that'd be sweet we can check those out and i'll get into a more uh adequate um definition here in a minute but uh Professionalism to me is just one of those things that I feel like I know it when I see it. Um, I know Sorry it's to good and yeah. Listen, there's some weird stuff with your audio. Um, actually, it's like coming in and out. I think we had this problem last time. Do you want to try your headphones again? Sure. Sorry about this. Zach. I don't know. I don't know what it is. It was working fine before the show. <laughs> and then again. Maybe you know. Maybe it's time to invest in a new computer here. All right, this might be a little annoying, but hopefully you can hear me now. Yeah, it's it's better, but it just try to, it's quiet when the mic's away from your mouth, so just try to, try to keep that mic closer. Right, I'll do my, I'll do my best to try and keep it, keep it right here. Um, but, uh, you know, to me, professionalism, like on the river is one of those things um, that I know it when I see it. You know, like I can tell when it's uh, like good professionalism or, or it's fully professional and, you know, when it's maybe lacking. Um, so if you've thought about it, you can go ahead and throw up a, a definition. Otherwise, I'm going to move right into um, what, like, Merriam-Webster, like if you were to look this up in the dictionary, uh, professionalism, the conduct, aims, or qualities that characterize or mark a profession or a professional person. Um, yeah, now that's great. And so, like, I really just wanted to get into, like, what are the characteristics of professionalism? And as I kind of did a little research on this on this subject, um, these were were like some characteristics that I came up with. So there's like seven of them. Um, and then there's gonna be like, we can detail each one. So the seven, um, we wanna be looking professional. We wanna have a neat appearance. Um, this idea of uh, interpersonal and intrapersonal skills, uh, most commonly, I think uh, everybody would recognize them or refer to them as soft skills. Um, but I kind of like this idea of uh, how you interact with people and how you interact with yourself. Um, obviously, organization is key. You want to have a good balance of confidence and competence, um, be able to maintain composure, um, have a level of responsibility and be aware of like your actions and how they impact others. Um, so for this idea of uh, being neat in appearance. Um, the big one to me here is, uh, well, I mean, they're all important, but I really like thinking of um, dressing for, you know, dressing for the office, right? And our office is on the river. And, you know, we all think it's cool to have that, like, old ratty, um, you know, uh, faded PFD um, because that's what look, looks rad. Uh, but I think that having, like, a new clean PFD EFD and clean uh, personal protective equipment is pretty key um, for dressing uh, for for this job, for being on the river. Um, and then if obviously you should have like clean on river clothes, clean off river clothes, and then maybe even like a specific um, kitchen set of clothes. And obviously this is specific for uh, a multi-day guiding, um, which is, you know, which is kind of what I love about uh, guiding. Um, and the kitchen one 
is kind of big. Uh, you should be wearing a clean, you know, a clean shirt, clean pants. Um, you know, we use aprons often. Uh, you should also be wearing a hat uh, so that, you know, hair isn't falling into the food. Um, and uh, if you were to take a, like a food handler's awareness um, certification or food handler's card, uh, you would know that you also need closed shoes uh, in the kitchen. Um, hygiene and self-care, right? We should be washing our hands. We really live in a fishbowl. Our guests are watching us all the time. You know, we should be washing our hands, taking care of ourselves. Um, the big one here to me really is also things like uh, sunscreen, you know? Uh, getting sunburnt is like the first clue to, to like being a novice almost, right? So I think that um, being able to maintain your hygiene, your self-care, stay hydrated. Um, if you find yourself getting aggravated or frustrated, you know, take a minute and drink some water, eat some food. Um, proper footwear on the river, I think, is really important. Whether you choose to use closed-toed shoes or, like, ch chacos or some sort of sandal like that, uh, um, it's important that they're not falling apart. Uh, you know, I've seen river guides out there, and uh, midway through a trip, their chaco straps fall apart, and, and their chacos are falling off of them, right? Like, this is this just totally, this looks bad on all levels. Um, and it's, you know, it's poor risk management. You just increased your risk. Um, and then I think that every guide, especially on uh, multi-day trips, uh, should have their own personal gear. So things like a tent, a sleeping bag, a sleeping pad, uh, all these things are really important. Um, I also think that it's important to know when and where to set these things up. Uh, you know, I've, so many times I've seen, you know, guides crawl underneath a kitchen table in a rainstorm. Uh, um, and, you know, that's neat and novel and fun and you look cool. Uh, but I don't, I have a hard time thinking of it as like good professionalism or, or uh, proper professionalism. Um, so, you know, yes, oftentimes we don't set up our tents and get caught in that 3 a.m. rainstorm and that, you know, on multiple occasions I've popped my tent up at you know three or four in the morning um, it sucks but you know uh, um, that's what you got to do uh, I also think that like not sleeping in the kitchen or sleeping in the chair circle is, is, is kind of key as well um, you know if if, uh, if guests wake up at you know 5 30 which oftentimes they do um, <laughs> you know it's kind of awkward for them to be sitting in the chair circle staring at you while you're asleep. So, uh, you know, consider, consider having uh, an adequate, proper professional place uh, to spend the night. Uh, and, and then here we go into these, this idea of soft skills, these interpersonal and intrapersonal skills. And being a good, com uh, good communicator is huge. Um, you need to communicate effectively. You need to uh, convey messages and information, not only to your guests, but to your guides and other boaters. Um, communication with other boaters, that happens all the time on the Rogue River um, or even on like really busy rivers like the American. Um, you should be really communicating with those other boaters where they're camping. Um, can we pass? Do you wanna pass? Uh, these sorts of things. Um, and you should be using your guide voice. Right. It's, I know it took me a while to uh, really establish like a, a um, an effective guide voice where I'm speaking up um, confidently and so that everybody can hear me. Um, as part of communicating, uh, you also need to be an active listener. Um, so making sure that you're listening to your guides needs uh, and the needs or the desires of your guests. I think it's really important to be funny and entertaining on the river. Um, but I don't know how many times I've like shoved my foot in my mouth telling bad jokes. Uh, so <laughs> I've really gotten away from telling anything that has to do, like any jokes that have to do with like gender, race, have foul language, sex, uh, sexuality, et cetera. Um, and I've really narrowed my uh, uh, repertoire of jokes down to what we'd call like dad jokes, you know, bad puns, um, uh, you know, third grade level funny haha -ha jokes. Um, and uh, being 
personable and outgoing. You should be, uh, a, a, um, you know, like inviting your guests in like, this is your home. Um, anytime you have folks on the river with you, you're treating them like their guests in your house, you know, offering them drinks, offering them food and snacks, um, offering them a place to sit, giving up your seat, um, taking their dishes for them. Anything like this, uh, <clears throat> I think is really important to, uh, you know, take your professionalism to the next level. And then I think professional language is super key here. Um, and what I, the big thing for me in the outdoor industry is having inclusive language. So I, I typically try and avoid phrases like, hey, you guys. Um, I use, I, I enjoy using you all. Um, I've heard other people say, hey, everyone, or my people, hey, friends. Um, but I think it's important to find something that is representative of your personality that works for you. Um, and then also avoid things like jargon. I think that our guests, uh, when, when we're speaking and we're using a lot of guide jargon about river features or whatever it is, I think they feel a little left, left out because they don't know what that stuff means. Um, also, I would avoid swearing all the time. I think it's just a good good practice. Um, it, can be, it can be challenging at times maybe, but uh, you know, learn to change your vocabulary uh, to be a bit more professional. And then we should be authentically interested um, really in our guests. You know, we should be engaging and asking them questions. I think uh, we, we wanna try and avoid talking too much about ourselves, about other guests, maybe past guests. Um, oftentimes I get questions like, like, hey, what's the worst guest you've ever had? And I just think it's really unprofessional to talk about anybody else that's been on our trips or our other guides. Um, it can, like somebody may be listening in and if you're talking poorly about a past guest or you know this funny guest or whatever, your current guest might be starting to think, well, what does this person think about me? Um, and what are they gonna tell the next people? So I think it's a really good idea to just avoid talking about past guests entirely. Um, and then I like to, uh, Think about having empathy and compassion for, for these folks. Um, a lot of times they can be unfamiliar with the outdoors. They may be, be um, you know, really uncomfortable to, to go to the bathroom outside. And so um, providing opportunities for them to gain confidence um, and have empathy for their, for their fears or um, their uncomfortability. Um, I'd really like to avoid this, this shaming culture that seems to be rather prolific in the in the outdoor industry right now. Um, you know, there's a lot of terms out there like uh, Jerry's, um, and these are people that you know may be really new to an activity. Um, and I don't think that it creates an inclusive community. You know, I, I want to avoid we want to avoid making fun of anybody who might be new because we were there at one time, right? And uh, what we really want to do is be a champion for those people. Well, encourage them, bring them up, um, and you know, just be supportive of somebody who's just, just getting into to a new activity. Um, being organized is pretty important. And there's uh, a few things here that I think you should be in or organized about. First off is your personal gear, right? We don't wanna like, you know, just leave our personal gear strewn all over the beach. You know, our PFDs over here, our sleep kits over here, our day bag is over here. Um, we should really try and keep all that stuff together and organize so we, we know where it is. And we don't have to ask, ask us if anybody has seen our stuff. Um, so keep track of it, uh, uh, keep it organized, know where your stuff is. And I think that organization when rigging your raft is crucial too, not just to look good and be professional, but I think it also uh, minimizes risk. We're reducing, we're really reducing entrapment hazards if we keep a organized, well-rigged raft. Um, and I think this gets into like our time management. Um, if we're organized, we should be arriving to our chores on time. If you're on dinner crew, right, and the lead guide or the lead cook says, hey, we're going to 
start cooking at X, Y, and Z time, 5.30. You're there, you're in your proper clothing, ready to work. Um, being punctual, I think, is, is, is a part of being organized. Um, but this idea of adaptability, being adaptable, um, don't be so constrained to your organization that you end up falling into, uh, you know, what Zach seems to think is my favorite talk about heuristic traps. Um, be adaptable. Don't fall into a commitment trap um, because you're you're so organized and you have this list of X, Y, and Z and it needs to happen in this way. Um, I like to, yeah, I'll keep going on uh, here. Next slide. Um, I really, really like to have, think about having a good balance of confidence and competence. Um, if you have too much confidence and not enough competence, you're going to find yourself in some pretty, pretty hairy places. And this might be like some pretty poor risk management. Um, and if you're overly competent but don't have enough confidence, uh, um, you really might, you, you, you're not going to grow and you're not going to challenge yourself. So this idea of confidence and competence, we should be making, uh, we should be trying to achieve balance, um, balance for that. Um, you should really be the expert to your guides. Uh, and, not just in your technical skills. So obviously, you should be a good boater, um, but you should be uh, continuing your learning. Um, you should know about the area, uh, the natural and human history of the area, the geology, the flora, fauna, the astronomy, um, and continue learning. You know, like, uh, keep keep learning. Uh, have the knowledge of a local. I like to avoid making things up. It's really easy to do just to like throw logic at something. Um, and oftentimes if I do make something up, I, I, uh, you know, I tell the guests, oh, I just made that up. Uh, and that's kind of funny, it's good humor, um, but be honest with them. I think that gives credibility. Um, and it's, it's really okay to say, I don't know. If you don't know something, don't make it up. Say, I don't know, but follow up with that. You know, maybe there's another guy that, um, that has that knowledge. Um, and that's why you're a team. You know, maybe somebody there is really a, you know, you know into geology or is a geologist, and uh, you can go find that answer out for a guest. Um, and we should have these passion for the area that we're working in, um, for the river, for wild places, and be able to express that. I mean, if you're not passionate about the areas that you're working in, uh, really, why are you there? Maybe you should ask yourself that. Um, and then this this idea of being humble, um, I like to avoid like talking about how rad I am, right? Uh, we should really not be um, gloating about all the gnar that we've run um, and how badass we are as guides. Uh, we should take a humble approach to this. Now, that's not to say that like we should avoid this all the time. Obviously, we like we're teaching. Um, rafting at times and you know guests are often interested in like rivers that we run and like there's certainly times that you can, can um, you know gloat about how much of a, a badass you are if you will um, and then certifications uh, if you really want to take your your uh, professionalism to the next level um, you know I you I call them like trading cards at some point you know get them get as many as many uh, certifications as you can. Just continue that education. First aid, CPR, uh, food handlers, leave no trace, swift water rescue. There's a ton of them out there. You know, um, just continue to educate yourself. I think is a is a great idea. Really takes your professionalism to the next level. Um, this idea of composure, uh, emo your emotional control, and staying. Poised. Uh, you should be staying calm in all situations, whether it's a, you know, maybe it's a frustrating guest. Maybe you're in a debate or an argument with another guide. Um, maybe your camp was taken by a private boater. Uh, you know, maybe there's a challenging rescue situation that, that uh, you need to deal with. But we should uh, try and keep our emotions in check, stay poised. Um, and I think this, uh, 
it gives gives others the ability to rely on you for your sound judgment. Um, and being focused on the trip, uh, be clear about the goals with your guests for the for the day, for the trip, for you know the next few hours when we're going to have lunch. Um, try and keep that trip moving forward. Um, and I think this gets back a little bit to time management. Um, I always stop my trips for lunch at like 12 or 12.30. Anything after that and people start getting hungry. Um, and so, and then if I need to keep moving, you know, I'll tell my guides like, hey, it's whatever, 12.30 now. I really want to be back on the river by 1.15. Um, and that way my guides have a, a, a goal um, and they can stay focused on, you know, setting up kitchen or setting up lunch, cleaning it up and getting moving again. Um, really staying focused and keeping that trip moving forward. And this kind of gets in uh, that emotional control kind of gets into this positive attitude. Um, we need to have a positive attitude, rain or shine. You know, if you're going to sit there and complain and moan about the rain and the wind, like it's really going to be a drag for, you know, the guests as well. So um, we, we really need to keep that in check. Um, and maybe they're long days, maybe you have a 20 mile day ahead of you and you're not gonna get into camp until late. You need to maintain that positive attitude. Um, and have a proper demeanor. Um, be well-spoken, be tactful with guests, guides, um, other boaters, uh, and just be respectful of them. I think that gets back to this idea of like proper communication, adequate communication. Great. Um, being responsible, like, you know, this idea of being a raft guide um, kind of comes with these perceptions of an irresponsible lifestyle. <laughs> um, that we're out there to just party all the time and, you know, we're nomadic and we, you know, are home free, whatever. Um, but there's a responsibility that we need to maintain for ourselves and for our guests on the river. On the river. Um, so we should be reliable. I don't think we, you know, it's not a good idea to make promises that you can't keep. You know, oftentimes I get guests that are like, hey, we really want to go to this, uh, this water slide or this waterfall. And, you know, it may not line up with your time frame. So don't make, uh, don't make promises you can't keep. Again, I think having that launch around noon, 1230, um, it really increases that reliability. People know to count on you that you're gonna provide for them at a specific time. Um, and then respond to requests promptly. Um, you know, if somebody need, has a broken sleeping pad or a broken sleeping pad and you have your spare kit there, um, get it for them immediately. Don't, you know, oh, you know, I'll wait for after dinner. You know, uh, delegate it to somebody, get, make, that, make that request promptly. Um, and then hold yourself accountable, own your mistakes, uh, learn from them, uh, offer solutions to those mistakes, I think is really important. Um, this idea of risk management and being responsible, like I know we often ask our guests if you know they're, they're required to wear their PFD all the time on the river. You should be modeling that as well. Um, never do something is the opposite of what you're asking your guests to do. You know, we ask our guests to wear PFDs if they go swimming in the river. If you go swimming in the river, you wear your PFD. If you're going to ask guests to wear shoes in camp, you wear shoes in camp and be consistent with those requests. Um, drinking and drugs, and I think this is huge because it's such a perception of the culture of raft guiding. Um, but I, th this idea of pro overall professionalism is, I think, can really change the way we're perceived um, in the outside world. And so keeping drinking to a responsible level, if at all, um, obviously never on the water. And we're, we're obviously never doing drugs with guests or um, on the river as well. And the, you know, the, um, the, most, the most common cause for drownings on the river, deaths on the river is usually either drinking or no PFD or a combination thereof. So um, we really want to be modeling the behavior that we want to see on the river with this drinking and drug usage. 
Um, and then being self-aware, how are our actions impacting others? Um, we should be really, uh, you know, taking into account our ethical behavior. Um, are we committed to doing the right thing? And uh, we spoke a little bit of, about ethics a few weeks ago, specifically in how we treat the outdoor environment uh, through leave no trace ethics. Um, I, you know, I always tell folks, follow your heart, make good life choices. If you were to look down deep inside and ask your heart what the, you know, what the answer is, it should, you know, it'll tell you and uh, it'll be honest. Um, I think, again, guides really need to be aware of being able to separate personal lives um, and their professional lives with guests. Um, you know, avoid talking too much about your personal life um, uh, with guests. And obviously, this is kind of, I think this is kind of a gray area because by day three, by day four, by day five, you really start to develop like a, a, a bond or a relationship with, with a, a number of guests that um, can be really professional as well. Uh, we just want to be cautious of the amount that we're that we're kind of uh, you know intermingling those two. Uh, and this idea of right amount of enthusiasm, I think it's great that guides you know the spontaneous motivator. If you, you get we talked to um, I think uh, Dougie Fresh talked about that last week. Um, the spontaneous motivator. That's a, a great role for a guide to have and be enthusiastic, but not overly so that you know, guests feel drained or they feel awkward or, you know, I like to have this idea about like mimicking and mirroring the, the, the energy of the guests. Um, sometimes they need to get picked up and sometimes maybe they need to get taken down a little bit. And so by, by mirroring and mimicking that you can uh, help to bring it up or bring it down uh, the enthusiasm of the group. Um, and this, I you know, our job is not about us, right? Um, there may be requests from guests that you're just like, no way, I don't want to do that. Well, it's not about you. You know, if you need to set up the groover tent or whatever, or move the groover again, because they're, they're having trouble. Like we need to make those, those requests, those challenging requests. We need to, do, we need to do it in a timely fashion. Um, and not do it without attitude, like, or do it without attitude. Um, we're here, this is a guest service industry. And so, you know, again, watching your, your, uh, your emotions, maintaining that positive attitude um, and uh, making those, re fulfilling those guest requests. Um, and this finally, like reflect on your actions. I, you know, I think about uh, the things that I do all the time and how well the trip went and what could be done better um, so this idea of self-reflection, I think is really important and it encourages learning and adapting and growth. Um, so I think that's all seven. I think I went, I, I did a pretty good job of, um, getting down into some details with seven characteristics of, um, professionalism in a, in a river guide con context. Um, anything that, you think I, you want to add Zach or that you think I missed? Well, I, I have a bunch of notes. I have nothing to add or think you missed, but I have questions I want to ask you. And I think I fixed the audio thing. So you can try to take your headphones off now. It's okay. actually, when I put myself on mute, it causes that problem. And I figured it out about oh, far way through. So okay. I think you can be more comfortable and not to hold that microphone up. <laughs> We're about to find out. All right. Um, well, if anybody following along has questions or wants to like say, Hey, is this professional that professional? professional or add something it's super fun to interact with you all so please add questions but if we don't have any and i'll just go through mine and i'll intersperse other ones as they come first of all the thing i really liked was that it's not about you that to me basically says is this guy professional or not are they there for the right reasons are they there for themselves or are they there to like take people on a trip and yeah. be a professional guy and so like a couple examples i just thought of on that one were like stopping to see friends. If you're rowing down the river and you have friends at a camp, like it's cool to wave to them and say hi in my mind. But when you like pull over, make your guests wait while you'll give people hugs and you realize their experience is basically our vacation was stopped so we can watch you have more fun with your friends. And so that's, that's a, a point. big one to me. Or sometimes guides will stop at certain hikes for personal reasons. They'll take guests places for whatever personal reason when the guest didn't maybe didn't want to hike or it wasn't on, the, you know, there's, there's just things you do to like 
meld the trip to your needs. And that's that's that to me says a lot when I see guys doing that sort of thing. Uh, they, they put put themselves their needs before the needs of their guests. Um, so that was just I love that one. I never even yeah that that was a big one to me. But um, I talked. I, I liked what you said about the faded gear look. Uh, mm-hmm. Why do you think that's so prevalent? Do you think it's because people like the look of the faded gear or because they just don't want to replace it? I, you, mm, I've, I've, I've been that guy, right? Like I've had Me the too. PFD Me for too. like, I've had the PFD for, um, you know, five, six, seven seasons. And um, reflecting back on it for me, I think it's my ego, right? My faded life jacket says that I've been on the river a lot. Mm-hmm. And you can see that because my, because my equipment is used. Um, and I, I kind of have like an attraction to um, used equipment. I don't like the look of something brand new because it doesn't give that perception of he actually gets out there and gets after it. So, mm-hmm. but I, I, you know, I've, I've done the self-reflection thing and gone back and be like, no, you know what? Like, I want to continue. It's not about me. Um, it's about presenting an appearance um, and a perception for our guests and whether they notice it consciously, um, I think they definitely recognize it subconsciously. Um, and if they go back and reflect or go do a different trip and see it somewhere else, it might click for them. Um, so I, th- I think it just, you know, having a, a, you know, clean exterior, clean PFD um, is a good idea. That being said too, the, the seven, eight, nine year old PFD, those things uh, off gas and, they lose their buoyancy. They're not as buoyant as they were the day you pulled it off the shelf. So I think it's also about uh, risk management. You know, that new piece of gear, it's, it's your safety. It's, um, so uh, I, I think that, you know, maybe not every year, but every couple of years, you should be replacing your equipment. Yeah, and that, I think that's helmet, PFD, shoes. People, I see a lot of guys with shoes that are duct taped together. Or they're proud that they're about to fall apart. Right, right. I think I've had, I did the same thing. I used to have worn out stuff. So I would look cool. Be like, Oh man, that guy's been around forever. And it, I self reflected on it too. And I realized you're wearing the old stuff, maybe to look cool to other guides. But when guests show up, they don't expect their, their guides to be in tattered gear. Right. I think, I don't right. think the guests have that respect. If they show up, see you wearing nice looking new stuff there, that's, that's how to get respect out of your, your, your guest now other guys might be like oh man that guy has a brand new shiny pfd and give you a hard time but like that shouldn't matter right what should matter most is the guests definitely um, I, I actually really like this comment here um is it halder yeah. uh um you know if you're if you're not if you're not purchasing everything at the same time then you know like <laughs> you're, you're, you're not spending your entire tip on uh uh all new gear, right? So like maybe one year you buy a new life jacket or PFD, the next year you buy new shoes, the following year you get a helmet. And so like every three years, you're kind of rotating through these yeah. these pieces of equipment. I was thinking about, about uh, equipment in terms of you mentioned having your own camping gear for overnight trips and having a tent. On the salmon, where we do a lot of trips, we always bring a tent because it rains pretty regularly in the summer. Yeah. But a river like the Rogue, where I know you spend a lot of time, it rains maybe once a summer. Would you bring a tent on every trip as a professional guide or take that chance? So it's fun. It's funny you say this because typically I, I bring a tent every time. I have like a little small backpacking one that fits, you know, nice and neat in, uh, um, in, my, in my gear bag with all my clothing. I can fit everything I need into a, into a fairly small bag and it's pretty organized. Um, and there was one trip this past season um, that it was like, ah, I don't need it. It's not going to rain. Like the weather forecast looks fine. Um, and I didn't bring it. And on day two, it looked like it was going to rain. And I didn't, <laughs> maybe I shouldn't be saying this either, but like I didn't bring tarps. I didn't bring, I didn't bring tarps <laughs> for guests either. <laughs> so I was like, it's not going to rain. Uh and like halfway through the day, it looked like it was going to dump rain. And I had nothing for myself. I had nothing for our guests. And I was like, I was kind of freaking out a little bit. It, it ended up not raining, but 
you know, uh, proper, I, I've said it be, in the past, proper preparation prevents piss poor performance. So uh, I won't, I won't do that again. <laughs> no matter That's what, I'll always have it. I'll Sorry always have rest. that. That's all right. I'll always have that tarp. I'll always have my tent, you know. That's a mistake if, you only make once, right? Yeah. The no tarp for the guests. Like the one Definitely. time you don't have it, you never make it again. And yeah, tent too. Like I, on the Rogue, I, I, if I don't bring a tent, I have a solution for myself that doesn't depend on borrowing something. Like I have like a small bivy sack or some solution right. just in case at a minimum. Yeah. Uh, can you go to that that one slide go back a few slides there's one that is because i have a lot of things i'll ask about this one yeah. it was good the good communicator one okay back this early on yeah sorry it's just a little it's a little slow some of these photos were pretty high quality <laughs> <laughs> they're not being but, a a fairly large file for me but what i'll ask is this one as yeah. I was thinking about this one, whoops. What if your this one, the interpersonal, interpersonal skill? Yeah. So I sort of saw the first three as things that you don't you can't really learn or control. And the second three you kind of can control. That's mm -hmm. that's how I kind of broke these up when you were talking about them. What if you're not a good communicator? What if you're not humorous? What if you just aren't funny? Like some people aren't funny, or if you're not personable, I, are you can you be a guide still? I, I totally think so. I think that, um, you know, it, it th like, obviously you're not gonna, um, uh, hit all this stuff on the head. Like the, the first time, like it takes years to, to, to start to, um, well, depending on your personality to really be adequate or even good at some of these things. Um, you know, I remember in my guide school, uh, the first time that I'm put on this, you know, on the, in the guide seat, in the hot seat, and you want me to yell commands. Um, it's an interesting place to be, right? Like you need to know exactly what you want. You need to know how to ask for it or request it or demand it because it's, you know, so developing that guide voice, I think is really challenging, but um, you spend time around uh, other guides, um, maybe other companies working for multiple companies. And you start to pick up on the nuances of how people do things and they develop um, like their own style, right? Your own style as a guide, your own style as a personality. Um, and it's very much kind of like, you know, I, I, I want to be authentic, but at the same time, like it's almost like wearing a mask at work, right? Um, I'm trying to be outgoing and personable. Um, and you may have to step into some vulnerable situations, you know, like I've been a shy, I, you know, I was a shy kid growing up. Um, and I really have to work at, um, being engaging with guests. Uh, it takes a little bit of work for me, um, to, to really make that happen and to be good at it. Um, I'm still working on it. Um, it's not, it's definitely not something I've perfected yet. So I think it, it comes with it comes with practice and it comes with time. Do you do you sort of see what I'm saying? No, the first three, you're they're hard to get better at. Like you sure. can professional language, you can just be like, yeah, I'm not gonna swear, I'm not gonna act stupid. Mm -hmm. You know, interesting, interested. You can literally just ask somebody questions and be interested in them, right? And empathy mm -hmm. and compassion, you're like, yeah, I'm gonna care about people. But the first three, those you make choices through the last three. The first three, you are kind of in your DNA a little bit. Do you think you, know, you can get potentially? Um, but you know, like like being humorous. I mean, when I first started guiding, it was really culture to to if you're a river guide, you have to know jokes and you have to know all the jokes. So I started just like <laughs> collecting jokes and some pretty bad ones. Um, and used them quite often. Um too often. And you know, there were a couple of times that I got in trouble for that. Um, so I've really pared my joke repertoire down to like what I said is dad jokes. Um, I think that's an easy way to like be a little bit more engaging and outgoing um, and be a little kind of funny at the same time. You have to be okay with people like not laughing at your dad joke or your silly <laughs> pun, you know, but uh, I, I think that it's, it's working towards being humorous or working towards having some, you know, 
uh, maybe that gets into this uh, engaging piece. Uh, mm -hmm. Be engaging. Okay, well, you mentioned auth authenticity. Now's my next question. Um, and you, you mentioned earlier, like, to, you want to be authentically interested in your guests. Yeah. What if you're not? Like, you I, know, what if you are not authentically interested in your guests? That's a good, that's a good question. Then like, maybe you're in the wrong profession. Maybe you shouldn't be in, you know, like guest services. I, I, I don't know. I don't have, I don't know if I have an answer, but, um, you know, again, it's not about you. Are you, are you doing this because you get to be on the river all day and it's rad for you? Or are you doing this because you enjoy sharing these places with others um, and getting to know other people? Um, and so I, I, that may take some work as well. Like I said, I, I, I grew up shy as a kid and it, it, it took me a while to become, uh, to really start engaging with folks. Um, so I continue to work on it, um, but if it's not authentic, if you're just like, hey, whatever, later, or um, where are you from? Oh, that's cool. Have a good day. You know, I, it, people see that and it, it's not going to reflect well on on you as a guide, as a river guide. Yeah, I mean, I think you can be interested in people. You can, that's a thing you can choose to do. I'm going to choose to be interested. But right. to be authentically interested, I don't know if you can choose to be authentically interested. You could fake it. <laughs> that's not authentic. That's that's interested. That's you can't <laughs> pretend to be authentically interested. And right. I think one, for me, that's one thing uh, I found in my career. You know, I'm authentically interested in May, but it's way harder for me to be authentically interested in August after I've met hundreds of people, and I've been authentically interested in them all summer long. At some point, they're like, "Yeah, I, I'm a shoe salesman." I'm like, "Cool." Like it's hard for me, and. My only solution for that is like taking time off. Yeah, fair enough. I, you know, it's a it's a social marathon. Um, if yeah. you're working, if you're working that much in in, the, in those many days, um, and, it, and you know that gets back to this idea too of like you know checking yourself, being self aware, and having that emotional control. Um, and it may you know it may not be easy, uh, but again, it's that marathon. Um, and I'm not saying that, you know, and it is a marathon. It's not a sprint, right? So don't just like go out there and blow all your energy on day one. All we, you know, uh, ease into it. Um, yep. as, a, as a trip leader, I think that, that it, it's, it's a, it can be really challenging because you're always on. The guests are always coming to you with questions because you're the face of the trip. Um, so it's hard to, you know, it's, it's really important to be able to take uh, personal time find personal time for yourself, um, you know, on each trip, each day, if it's just 10 minutes to go sit by yourself by the Creek. Um, I think that that's a, a great idea to help with that, that emotional, um, stamina, that social stamina and, and complete the marathon. I think you and I, that's important because we're ex introverts. I think you're an introvert. I'm definitely an introvert. I need to, I like being around people. I just, Sure. I need to take half an hour sometimes just to beat by myself and just like think or go for a hike by myself. But I think some people as extroverts, they don't need that. They actually, that would, you know, they need to be around people interacting. Right. Yeah. I think as introverts, I think it's okay. Like, I think that's exactly true. Um, you mentioned earlier about when guests, I get this question a lot. Guests ask about your, tell us about your worst guests. Tell yeah. us about guests you had a bad time with. What do you say to that? How do you answer that? Um, I'm, well, I, I'm honest. Um, I've never, <laughs> <laughs> I've never really had a bad guest. Um, you know, I've had some challenging guests, but uh, in the long run, there isn't. There may be one person that really stands out as as frustrating, um, and I tell them, you know, like, hey, I'm just not really interested in, you know, talking about previous guests like i've always all my guests have always been pretty awesome um and you have to, i think the reality of it is to me is the guests that come on these trips especially multi-day trips um making that choice uh to step into quite a lot of vulnerability whether they're afraid of the river the rapids or you know sleeping on the ground or you know going to the bathroom outside uh they've already made a choice to be pretty vulnerable. 
Um, and so they're, they're usually pretty rad people, um, I think, especially on multi-day expedition trips. So I, I, I try and be as honest as possible and just, you know, just tell them that. All my guests are, all my guests are awesome. But what if they're, what if you have, you have that one person, I know you have that one person in your head yeah. right now. Yeah. So <laughs> that's, not, that's not honest to say you don't have that. Right. But you know, that one person though, like when I do the self-reflection, um, while they were challenging, uh, I think I could have changed my actions, my responses mm -hmm. to make the situation better. So that's, is, it, is it is it them or is it how I responded to them? Um, and so if I take the time to reflect on how I handled the situation, um, next time that person comes around, I'm well more equipped to handle it and be more professional about it and maybe potentially turn their attitude around. Cool. Um, but someday you're going to have somebody who's just – like Donald Trump's going to come on a trip and you're just going to be super unhappy. Right. Would you, let's say Donald Trump was your guest on a trip. Uh -huh. Would you, then the next trip, somebody asks, have you ever had a bad guest? What would you say then? Um, maybe it's not a bad guest. Hey, this is like a memorable guest. <laughs> <laughs> Here's my most memorable yeah. guest. And it's really because they're, you know, some sort of, uh, um, celebrity. You know, oh, the president of the United States was on my trip. That was pretty rad. And so it's a hard one for me because I've definitely had guests that have challenged me, and and I I've tried to self reflect. You might be better than me. I when somebody asks me, "Have you ever had a bad guest?" I in my head, I'm like, "Yeah, man, I got a couple," but I I don't talk about. It. I agree with you. You don't talk about it, but it's mm -hmm. hard for me to honestly say that. I just try to change the subject. I go, oh, yeah, you know, but nothing I really want to talk about. Or I couldn't honestly say no, I've never had one. Because we've had some things go – I could tell some stories. It's not that the person's a bad person. It's just that they made a mistake or did something. And it's – right. you know, but people really want that story. I think the well, point yeah. is it's not professional to tell those stories. Not at all. And, like, even if, yeah. the, you know, even if they're good stories, right? Like, this person was so awesome and they did this, that, and the other thing, like – we shouldn't be telling those stories either, right? I think it's just unprofessional to talk about guests in any capacity. Um, Cause I think it can make, I think it can really cause some vulnerable emotions for the guests that you're speaking to or the guests that are listening. That's interesting. Do you think, because if you, if a guest, if somebody, if you talk about a guest from like a month ago, somebody really, really cool. Do you feel like the current guests might feel like they're not living up to their, you know, they might feel insecure. Yeah, definitely. You know, are like, they gonna, guess what? Are they, a month ago, we spent the amazing time with these really cool people. Let me tell you all about them, right? And that's yeah. and as a new guide, you don't have a whole lot to talk about. You haven't lived that much life, it, but you right. did live this thing a month ago, or you go by a place where they did this certain thing, and you got to tell everybody about it. But it takes away from the current guest experience to sure. brag about other guests. Is that what you're, yeah. you're saying? Yes, <clears throat> completely. Yeah. That's that's a big one. I think I think it's also big like talking about last week or next week. Like it makes me think of it. You know, like if you're a guide and you're like, you know, hey, next week we have this group coming or last week this group came or you know, I feel like we want to make the people on the trip feel that trip is special and yes. not think about like have them think about you've been doing this all summer long. So trying to avoid even just like not the previous guests but just like oh last week we did this or next week we're gonna do this next week we have a bluegrass trip right because it makes them like wow they're the guys are focused on next week not this moment they're in now well, you know I, I you know if we're doing a specialty trip like oh there's this cool trip next week you guys should come back or you all should come <laughs> back <laughs> Yeah, we maybe. all should come back next year and do this really cool other thing that we offer as well. Like this was a great introduction and, you know, for, you know, it, it's a little bit more expensive, but uh, we have these really rad um, chefs that come or these really rad musicians that are that they come and play. And, and that's also a, a unique experience. But do, I, I think it's a fine line, though, right? Like not like, hey, next week we're it's awesome trip we're looking forward to. 
Like, guess what? Your food here is just good. Next week we have gourmet chefs, right? <laughs> this week you have to listen to our bad jokes around the campfire. Next week we're not musicians. You know, there's one thing between like, hey, guess what? We can't wait for next week's trip. We can't wait for you guys to leave so we can have more fun yeah. with this other group. It's almost like what you're saying, I think, is um, it's okay to talk about other trip types in the big picture of thing. Like, hey, we also right. do this type of trip and this type of trip, but that's the type of trip. But out of the context of like it being coming up sooner, we just finished it. You know, that right. was, I, oh, I can't wait. Well, for last this. week was so much fun. You, right. The group last week was the best. We jumped off rocks and we had <laughs> fun. And, you know, hey, sorry it's windy and rainy and cold this week. Yeah, right. But those can um, be amazing trips as well. You yeah. Know, there's something about going through, you know, embrace what, I, what I'd call embracing the suck. <laughs> um, really bond some groups together. Yeah. I I always say the, the the if it's gonna be the best river trip ever, there has to be one moment where you're huddled around the campfire drying out your socks. Yeah. If that didn't happen, it cannot be the best river trip ever. But we're getting on some asides. Uh, you talked about like inclusive words like Jerry's, which I just learned what Jerry's was myself. So I hope yeah. I'm not one. But another word is peeps. Peeps always bo has bothered hmm. me. Because I would be hate being called a peep. Right. What do you think about that what, word? What, what about people? Yeah. Hey, people. You know, I, I, had, I, I had an experience one time, and, and I think that, you know, like we need, I think that we need to be aware of things specifically like, hey, you guys, right? Because that's definitely exclusive. Um, but I had a, you know, <laughs> I'm going to have to talk about some guests here, but um, oh, you know, I, I, I had some guests. I had a, a boat full of women, and anytime I addressed the boat, I said "ladies," um, and I and I thought that was appropriate. And one of them didn't like me saying that, um, so I need I really needed to change my tactic on that. So I think that there's a fine line of really, um, you know, there, I think that there's some very overt vocabulary, um, and then some vocabulary that we may not get right away. So like peeps might be like that. Um, you don't like being called a peep because uh, it, you know, they think you're a, a marshmallow um, chicken. Uh, but um, you, they're not going to know that unless you bring that up to them. But I think things like "Hey, you guys" um, is very, you know, we can recognize why that is not inclusive. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. I just think peeps sounds demeaning to me. Like we're just another, we're just a flock, the flock for the week. Like, oh, we had peeps last week, we have peeps this week, we have more peeps coming. The way it gets used by guides is like, oh, the peeps are over there. You know, right. like almost like it's the like guides use it derogatorily. Like, uh, yeah, yeah, no, I feel like that's the way, to, like, oh, like, yeah, I feel like it gets used that way. Like if you're go to Bhutan, you know, if you're a foreigner, they call you a chillup. You know, mm -hmm. or if you go to Mexico, if, what's it called again? A gringo. I think gringo. like peeps is kind of a word like that. Right. And I mean, everybody watching, you probably noticed Dustin and I use guest, like guest all the time. It's just our vocabulary. I love that word because it's like right. they really are our guests, you know, like we're hosting them. And I think that's a respectful. I don't know if we, yes, yeah, the word we wouldn't say, hey, guests, you know. Yeah, but I was thinking about that. I don't think so. But if somebody, if we were talking about guests from last year, not last week, or like typical, like people go like, hey, what are what are people typically like? I'm like, oh, guests are typically blah, blah, blah. I don't know, something like that. But I like that that word more than peeps. I think it just, I personally find it, think it's derogatory. Sure. And, I, I, you know, I, I think that in a multi-day commercial world, I think guest is a, a much more um, a common vocabulary word um where i think peeps really starts to come out in like day trips yeah, yeah. uh and and, uh, and other like I, you know i've heard plenty of other other jargon for for guests on day trips as well you just do, <laughs> yeah <laughs> on multi day trips so i think clients get used a lot clients yes you know, clients which i which i am not a fan of because it sort of says that they're there because of their client like it's a business tactic business relationship when they're really like Ideally, like guests, not like they're there, like a business relationship. Um, and internationally, these packs a lot, PAX, because it's oh, passengers. 
You know, like we get a ten packs. Like, well, oh yeah, yep. We got we have packs over. I don't know. That's that's a word I've always thought was a little strange. Uh, all right, move on. Uh, so you talked about being humble, and uh-huh. I like that a lot. Uh, what about like so? So I wouldn't go and bragging about myself. You know, I feel like maybe if you feel insecure, uh, you might have to like maybe have to for some reason. I, I don't know, but like I think that that's good to be confident enough that you don't need to brag about yourself. But how do you feel about talking about other guides? Like, is it okay to like talk other guides up? Um, I, I think that, uh, you know, it, I, there are no absolutes. It depends. Um, I'm certainly not going to talk down about another guide. Um, and, you know, I might talk up about another guide, but it would be a guide that's on that trip. I wouldn't be talking about oh, guides yeah, yeah, yeah. that aren't on that trip. They're not going to know them. Um, and so certainly I'm trying to like build, build up my team. Um, and I would only talk positive about them, especially in front of other guests. Um, and if I had something some like constructive or some growth oriented feedback for that, for that guy, you know, I'd pull them aside and, and, uh, Tell them I guess what I'm it. saying is like if you're on the raft with a guest, you're you know some guy some guides will be like, oh, I've kayaked 50 foot waterfalls and I travel around the world and look at me, I'm like living life on you know. Whereas I feel like I feel like that's not good, and I think we agree on right. that. But what do you feel about like if I'm on a raft and I'm like, man, Emily over there? I don't know if you know Emily. She's she's a guide on a trip. She's a big time kayaker. She travels around the world. You know, she kayaks waterfalls all the time. She probably would never tell you this. But you know she's super rad, and then Dustin over here, you know he's a he has a master's degree in rec, you know recreation, the outdoor leadership protection, and I, I always forget the whole name of it. But it's a you know, master's it's degree in, in being rad, and you know you have a long storied career as a guide. Like, is it okay for me to brag about the other guides on the trip? I think so. I like I my you know usually when I do that, I find that. Um, it's because that guest may have something in common with that guide. And I'm like, Oh, mm-hmm. you know, like you should really go talk to this person. Cause they do all this rad stuff that you might be interested in chatting with them about as well. Yeah. So, um, yeah, certainly. I think that that's, I mean, as much as I want to try and uh, avoid talking too much about other people, cause I think that it, it doesn't, it, it doesn't allow the individual to, develop a perception of that person on their own right if you're if you're like oh hey this person over here is really rad that you know that guest that you're talking to may now has a tainted perception of that person being really rad and so that they they may treat them a little different subconsciously i don't know but i think that in general i think just talking about other people um is is not a is is not uh the best um, idea. Nick has a couple comments. Who is your worst guest response? Oh, counting today. Yeah, that's a. I, I've made that joke. If you have a good relationship with a guest, um, like they'll ask me, "Who's your worst guest ever?" And I might say, "Like, oh, other than you." <laughs> like that's uh, that's yeah, it has to be the right person. But like, I think right, that's definitely. pretty funny. I mean, beyond just your family, huh? That's a tough one. That's a way like I might divert it, you know, to something funny. Uh, but you right. definitely have to be careful who you say that to. Uh, pivot. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. It's just like, man, I can't think of the worst guest, but let me tell you about this one person that really stood out to me. Sure. Um, I think we were talking earlier. It's a fine line because you don't want to talk about like these really cool people you spent a couple weeks with, ago with. But maybe like, you know, a couple years ago, I went down the river with this guy who did a TED Talk. I have a guy in mind right now, like actually a guy who did a TED Talk. And on the trip, he did – his next TED talk for us. Oh, that's and he awesome. like, he was from Mexico city, but escaped persecution and went to wow. MIT and started businesses. And it was all about like, he's a really interesting guy. Right. Yeah. And so that trip was a couple of years ago. So that might do that. Be like, I can't think of a worse guest, but there's this really interesting guy I met a couple of years ago. What do you think about that? You know, I think in, in my heart, like I just want to avoid it altogether. Um, I, again, like, it's really cool. Um, and that's, he sounds like a rad individual and it's, and it's more about him as a person and the actions, you know, the, the, the life experience that that person had. Mm -hmm. Um, 
But what if the person that you're talking to is like, oh, I don't, you know, I want to be your best guest, but I don't have ne nearly the, you know, I don't have nearly the life experience that that gentleman had. Like I'll never yeah. be, I'll never be as good a guest as he was. I don't know. I, I think and I'm just throwing that, out ideas. I don't know. No, that's a good point. I think the point you're making is like a pretty advanced, important guide skill. And I think it's basically recognizing that you want to think about the people you're with and make them feel like they're the most important people at that time in a special place. Yeah. You know, you, you want to make, you want their experience to be special and for them to be special and not try to do things that could take away from that. And it's hard to do and it's advanced. I mean, like, you know, there's this, this idea and kind of getting back to Nick, Nick's, Nick's question or comment here. Um, pivot to your best guests. Well, if we're living in the moment and that all that really counts is right now, you know, the person you're talking to is your best guest. I mean, you, you could certainly, uh, you know, get it, you know, kind of combine, um, you know, the worst guest comment of being who you're talking to and the best guest comment that, you know, right now, like you're my best guest. That would be, I mean, to be able to say that authentically, I think is would be hard. Would be hard. Might, for be, might be challenging, but you know, yeah. is there is there? You know, I don't know. But Maybe play with it. Yeah, yeah. No, that's. I mean, if you say that, you'll learn something from that interaction, right? Oh well, that didn't yeah. work really well. So maybe I won't yeah. ever do that again. Yeah, I think uh, I was on a trip. I'm going to talk about like this a little bit. I was on a trip where I was with Audrey, and I remember Audrey was there, and I can't remember who else. But it was a full trip, and we had just done our favorite moments. We'd all had this like yeah. awesome emotional time, and we were standing up in the front. It had a nice campfire going and then like, Hey, somebody stood up and said, Hey, this is a, you know, it's very emotional, right? Like everybody's really into it. And, um, and with that finished and I felt like everybody's going to kind of go off to bed or starting conversations and somebody who was like important to the trip. I think it was like the guy who organized it or something. He goes, Hey, tell us about your worst guests. And we were like, Oh man, this is hard. <laughs> yeah. We did. We were it, for us to like among a big group, talk go from that important bonding experience talking about other people in a negative way was was not good and audrey stepped up and gave this amazing talk about how you know we're really lucky what we do exactly what you said we're really lucky what we do we don't have, have those kind of stories like people that come with us are generally really really cool interesting people yeah and you know although we probably all had somebody who annoyed us at some point on a trip uh, it was very tactfully handled by audrey i'll never forget that moment nice good job audrey Yep. Nick writes instead of guests, maybe team. Like a hey, team. I, I definitely like I think that that's a great um a great term to use. You know, again, like I, I my personality, I use you all. Uh, I think there's like a little bit of comedic value to it. And sometimes guests think that, you know, I'm from the south or something. Um, <laughs> uh, but you know, it like team I think is great. It's it's inclusive. Um you know, when you're addressing the, especially as a trip leader, when you need to address the entire, the entire group, like, all right, hey team, um, hey Northwest Rafting Company team over here. You know, uh, I think that that's, I think that's a great, great inclusive vocabulary. Yeah, Nick, I was as you as you, you're Dustin, you were talking. I was thinking about what I would say to a, a team. Like I just said it again. If I was going to talk to everybody, I think that's the term I actually use a lot. Team. Like, Hey team, let's let's get together and chat about the day or something like that. Uh, okay, I have one more question, then and, and then if anybody awesome. has questions, um, so you mentioned too about you know talking about your personal life with guests. Yep. Like, what's okay and what's not? Right? They're gonna ask, "Where'd you go to college?" And you're like, "Oh yeah, I went so and so and so." Where's that line? Yeah, you know, it's. I think you're gonna you're gonna have to play with it. You're gonna have to figure it out on your own. Um, you know, I, I'll typically like, I might avoid anything that's like, like might be perceived as negative. Like I, my girlfriend broke up with me or my girlfriend's cheating on me or uh, my grandmother just died or, um, you know, like I might avoid stuff like that. But yeah, I mean, you're getting to know these people and I think it is a fine line, um, especially on uh, uh, multi-day trips, you know, 
they're going to, they're going to become your friends. And there's, you know, there's guests uh, that I've developed relationships with over the years that I see on other rivers that I see uh, um, that I've bumped into randomly. Uh, so they certainly, they certainly do develop a, a relationship. Um, I just be careful jumping into that too quickly um, and making that assumption that like all the guests are my best friends and uh, they, I need to confide in them now or, or whatever it is. Um, so I, I think that just being, that having that self-awareness to to limit how much you're actually sharing or what they're actually interested in hearing um, you know maybe they're you know they're also being awkward and like eh, i'm gonna you know be a little outgoing here and try and get to know um dustin and uh i start a rant on you know uh my cheating ex-girlfriend like they may not you know that like that i don't know if that's appropriate i think guests some guests really like guide drama mm -hmm. you know they want to know the behind the scenes guide drama and i'm guessing that's probably guide drama is the thing you want to avoid yeah and I, you know and we all we all have you know there's you know issues between guides and certainly want to avoid talking about that so um, yeah Cool. I've, okay, one more, one more thing, and then we can call, wrap this one up, and you can go off and do Dustin stuff. Uh, I, I, you mentioned because you mentioned having friends, being friends with guests beyond the trip, and I, I have people who I like. I actually Howard, who we do trips with, we were supposed to go paddling today, right? Like, it's, you know, there's people who I've made friendships with that go way beyond the trips that we do. Sure. And um, when can you let that professionalism? What do you think about like after the trip, you're, you're friends with them. When can you start cussing with them? When can you start just being yourself? When do you, when can that professionalism veil drop? Like I, I, if you go visit you them know, or when, what's the, what's the line there? I've thought about that. Like the next time, like after the trip is over, like they have left and mm -hmm. you bump into them the next time, or, um, you know, like maybe you made a really strong connection with somebody and you are going to go boating with them or you're going to, or you're going to go skiing or whatever you're going to do with that person. Um, I think after they've left the trip and you're meeting up again, you know, you can start to let your guard down a little bit, but I still think it's, you know, like be, developing authentic, real connections with those people and not having that, that veil of I'm, I'm still on, at work right now. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't think you need that after you've left the trip. Um, so I think it, I think it, you should be professional with them up until the moment you um, maybe hug them goodbye or shake their hand and say goodbye. Um, and they get in their car and they drive off. Um, after that, I think that you can let your, your professional guard down a little bit. Uh, cool. Drop the act a little bit more. Yeah. Hopefully it's not an act, but hopefully it's, you know uh, what I mean? Like hopefully it's, it's just being professional. It is. And, uh, you know, part of it is also being, you know, just a, a good person. Yeah. You know, hopefully it's not, you're not, it's not so much of a, a, a check that you can't complete. And you're not like all the, the whole trip. You're like, it's been so painful to be professional. Right. With them, <laughs> and you finally shake their hand. Like, Oh my God, thankfully I can finally just be myself. Right. If that's the case, you're probably doing the wrong job. Yep. <laughs> um, well, I just want to finish up and go back to the first thing that I really, I, I, I started the, my questions with. I just really liked your comment about, it's not about you. I think that's like maybe the defining thing of professionalism. Like if it's about you, if you're there for your own reasons, you're probably not professional or acting professional. If you're there for the right reasons, which is to like share place you love with other people who want to see it. I think that's the right intention for professionalism. Yeah, I agree. I like uh, I had that breakthrough in listening to you talk, so I'm gonna put well, that in my you. note somewhere. <laughs> so, Good to hear. Well, Dustin, thanks for joining again. Hopefully, awesome. enjoy thanks, the rest Zach. of your day. If anybody has follow up questions, you can add them in the. If you didn't watch this live, you can add them in the comment section below on the YouTube video, and and I'll make sure Dustin sees them and tries to respond to them in a professional manner. Definitely, I would and, love that. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll try. We'll do this every Monday, almost every Monday at twelve thirty Pacific time. So, so tune in next week. Thanks, Dustin. Cool. Thanks, Zach.